past experience as a golf professional, PGA Tour caddy, custom fitter, and staff representative for a major equipment manufacturer, Weston Mon has seen every corner of the golf industry. Now settled down in Utah and equipped with a boatload of experience, Mon maintains a solid internet following, showcasing his stylish custom putters and a vast reservoir of golf knowledge. And with that, we welcome on uh, handmade sticks craftsman, golf expert, golf junkie, uh, Weston Mon. Weston, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. Wow, that intro was flattering. Thank you. <laughs> well, you. Well, you deserve it. Um, I'd love to start. I kind of touched on it. Uh, you have kind of this this very circuitous kind of wild ride in the golf industry. Um, you, you've, you've seen a lot. Um, I'm kind of curious if you could just sort of take me back to the beginning and just kind of walk us through really your, your journey in golf. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you the short version. <laughs> um, didn't really grow up with golf around me, but had a chance to attend a youth activity where a PGA Tour Hall of Famer was um, kind of doing a swing clinic essentially for a bunch of kids that had never played golf. And I was about 13 and I uh, happened to be Johnny Miller that was doing this clinic. And um, of course I was hitting just huge banana slices out, out of the driving range. And uh, he gave me a quick tip, um, you know, and it's just rotating my hands, close the face. And I actually started to hit some good shots. I mean, I was no miracle case, but it was, I was like, wow, these things are going in the direction I want them to. And, uh, but he did lean over to my mom and was like, man, this kid can really hit it. And then once my mom told me that, like I was hooked. And so she got me a set of golf clubs. I'd go out to the schoolyard and hit golf balls. And that's probably where most of my training came from randomly hitting houses and running. So no, I, I didn't get <laughs> caught, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's where it all started. And then, you know, played high school and college golf and um, became a PGA um, teaching professional. And yeah, I've just been around it the whole time there. It's interesting you, you mentioned Johnny because I, I mean, just personally, I, I think he's probably one of the more underrated golfers of all time. Um, and I think he's just an unbelievable ball striker. But it, it's interesting, it seems like he's kind of the, almost the, the, the patriarch of, of, of Utah golf. And it seems like, you know, it's really, when you, when you think about it, it's really impressive when, you know, Tony Finau, the Summer Hayes family, uh, Zach Blair, it, it seems like it's strange. You think Utah, you would think um, maybe it would be the home of, of a bunch of Olympic skiers, but there's really this, this kind of, it seems like this passionate golf community in Utah. Um, I wonder if you could describe if, if you feel like there's kind of this um, almost hidden fraternity uh, in Utah for golf. You know, golf in Utah is, is pretty unique. And yeah, Johnny Miller, he's played a part in, in the growth of the game for sure. Like I've seen him a part of so many junior tournaments, even hosting tournaments. I used to play in them as a kid. Um, so he's, he's played a big part. And, um, but from there, you know, there's just a good, strong recruiting, um, recruiting uh, universities for golf. And um, we have a very, uh, fortunate circumstance in our state where we have about 150 golf courses and most of them you can play 18 for under 45 bucks with a cart so it's very accessible and, and that's pretty good for a state that has a population of about three and a half million so um, I've, I've got five golf courses within 15 minutes of my house that I can go play and um, it, it's just a very available sport here in Utah so I'm pretty grateful for that but um, yeah, I mean, a lot of good players have, have come from here and there's a good competitive junior community, a lot of experience teaching pros and um, and yeah, I mean, lots of good things about Utah. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'd love to I'd love to transition from from using golf clubs to designing them. Um, if you were to describe the, the Weston Mon golf club design philosophy. Kind of, kind of where do you come from uh, from that standpoint when you kind of take a look at a blank canvas? Kind of how would you describe your philosophy? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, my golf club design, my designing really started back in the, the early to mid 90s. And that's when I started tinkering, drawing stuff and and really getting into golf equipment. And that bug has just stuck with me ever since. And I kind of call that the golden era of golf equipment because so many new technologies were happening so quickly. Transition from 
wood woods to metal woods and and new golf ball technology and so i really love that era a lot of nostalgia to that and as i came to putter making i wanted to capture some of that and so i used a lot of my experience around that era the 90s and and wanted to create kind of an old school style putter right uh, a lot of putter makers are doing very heavy putters and i think that's great for people that need heavy putters um, but nobody's really making those lighter putters that we used to have back in the 90s and so um, it can be done and um, but not many, not very many people are and so i thought that would be a good little niche to find making putter heads around that 330 gram weight range because mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of golfers out there that they golfed a lot during the 90s and um, still like those golf clubs and so it's been a good little niche and um, I would say I, I go for simple and classic designs. Um, maybe I'll get a little bit more technical or kind of crazy with some science in the future. But for now, we're, we're looking at single piece milled um, stainless steel, carbon steel, and um, just lighter putters than we're used to today. And uh, that's kind of my jam. Yeah, you use the word simple and classic, and I think a lot of your designs kind of uh, evoke some of the great putter designs of the past. Um, from what I can tell, just browsing your, anyone can tell, browsing your Instagram page, uh, the, the, I feel like the term golf junkie almost sells you short in, in some way. Uh, your knowledge of, of, of granular golf equipment history is, is almost unsurpassed. Um, how much have, have putters of the past, and, and maybe specifically, kind of what putters of the past um, have really kind of influenced you um, and inspired you? Yeah, so um, definitely Ping has a lot to do with, with the design I have, right? Carson Solheim making the Ping answer, um, and you know he was smart in patenting that when he did it um, back in the 60s, but um, that patent ran out and it was basically free game for anybody. And, and, you know, and I heard it best by Sean Toulon, you know, you can take a lot of people make ping answer style putters, but the real goal is to not mess it up because <laughs> you, you can, you can design something like a ping answer, but it just doesn't look good. And, and I come from a little bit of an art background and obviously I idolize Scotty Cameron and the putters that he makes. And there's just some really cool stuff when you get into what Scotty's doing and how he can make a ping answer style putter look more beautiful than the ones made by the company itself, right? So um, that, that's something that I, I really try and pay attention to um, and, and the artistry of it. It's more than just weight and science. You gotta make things look really good too. And, I, and I'm hoping that my designs capture some of that. Yeah, you talk about kind of drawing from the past. Uh, it's interesting, you wrote a really interesting Golf WRX article in 2019 where you kind of touched on the idea of um, it's very easy for some people now to, to sort of kind of flippantly disregard certain putters or designs and say, oh, that's, that's just a, a souped up, that's just a ping answer. And that's, I kind of, I would love to dive into this idea of kind of what some people might view as plagiarism versus inspiration and how kind of building on the past isn't necessarily copying, you know, the new, the new Ford Explorer, it's not just a souped up Model T, um, but it's, it's, it's drawing on the past. I'm curious if you could just kind of share your perspective on how kind of the past, even though it, it can basically, it can still teach us things even as we, we create uh, innovation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, as, as I've seen golf club companies progress there i kind of put two people in two different categories there's golf club designers and there's golf club makers and it, it's pretty interesting designers will make things look really cool but they're going to go through a relearning process as they start to put things together to create golf clubs that were made a long time ago and uh, one particular instance was listening to a great podcast for the lead designer of ping when they were designing the blueprint, they found out that the the blueprint prototypes that had more weight towards the heel of the club uh, performed better for better players. And and usually that would mean like the face would turn closed a little bit sooner. Um, 
you know, these types of things are being relearned all the time. And, um, and so that's, that's why it's important to understand what's been done in the past and why it was done a certain way. And it's been really fun to have conversations with people like Larry Bobka, who has an extensive resume with Wilson and, and, and then with Titleist and design and creation and seeing how things have progressed from there. Um, and it's funny because sometimes we find ourselves relearning things that kind of just happened in the past. Um, and, and I think those little nuggets are really cool. So it's just, it's good to keep an eye out for those things and why and understand them and, um, and, and realize what, why things are done a certain way. And I think, you know, for me in particular, making CNC milled putters, you know, I, I have a lot of respect to give to people like, um, um, uh, Bob Nardi, who was a pioneer in really figuring out the single piece CNC putter and, and the neck problem that occurred as, as well as, you know, other, oh man, all the names are, are like escaping me right now, but um, Tad Moore, like the father of CNC and then him being inspired by uh, TP Mills because he was hand shaping these putters out of blocks of steel and, and he wanted to create a more, a replicable process but with those designs and so there's a lot of history that comes into it and it's funny the the tree of milled putters it's a very short tree with short branches <laughs> and, and a lot of people are connected <laughs> that's really well put I, I would love to you know you mentioned earlier kind of the the golden age of, of golf club design and and, and building um, it seems to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that really one of the big turning points that really kind of blasted um, that into the mainstream um, was kind of the, the 97 Masters and, and Tiger bursting onto the scene. It seems like so much of the, the, the buzz and, and the hype around golf equipment, it almost inevitably ends up back on the 14 clubs in Tiger Woods' bag. Um, I'm curious kind of how you view um, to the, the, the success that he's had over his career and kind of the, the, the cottage industry that his success has sort of built as it relates to, to golf equipment. Yeah, no, I, it, Tiger Woods is just, I mean, for, for a lot of people my age, he's the man, right? And so I started golfing. My age too. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I started golfing around 95, 96, and, and that was, that was about the time when Tiger was starting to make a scene, winning all of his U.S. amateurs, right? And then uh, it was near the end of 96 where he made his tour debut. And uh, obviously, I mean, I, I was interested in golf, but I wasn't watching golf, right? And then when Tiger won the Masters, that was, that was a big deal for news in golf, like across the world. And that really captured me. My mom bought me the 97 masters recap videotape which i've probably worn out the the tape in you know my first putter design the highlands um as you know he it, it's i mean nobody can make an exact replica of it obviously because nobody has that putter but um it's definitely inspired the design that i have and i'm i'm really excited about it but but yeah man it, it, you always want to know what the best are doing and what they're using and um and that's been an exciting part of my life as I look at what the pros are using and why and uh, and it's been cool. Yeah, well, you know, when you kind of power rank the, the, the major moments in, in golf equipment design history, I think, you know, um, Tiger's win at 90, 97 Masters potentially is number one. I think a close second um, may in fact be season one of Driver versus Driver. Um, <laughs> I know that uh, you, I, I would love to, to, to kind of dive into your experience on, uh, on golf's version of The Bachelor. Uh, for, for those that don't know, uh, Driver versus Driver, the, the series on Golf Channel, um, kind of crowdsourced uh, designers from all around the country to find the new design for a uh, Wilson driver. Uh, you were in the inaugural season, you remember. Um, kind of take us through that whole process, how that, that's, uh, that's kind of a unique piece of golf history that you were a part of yeah yeah that I mean it's interesting history for sure I wouldn't say it's great it's way 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 <laughs> down on the back burner but um 
you know, it was a cool experience and, and really something unique that Wilson did. And, and, you know, if anybody tries to do something unique, they're going to be criticized for it. So, you know, kudos to them for putting themselves out on the line to try something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I think some cool stuff happened from it. Uh, my experience there, you know, is your, your typical reality TV show where there's not much reality going on and <laughs> things are kind of, you know, where things are going to go. At least the producers do. And they try and create that reality experience. But that's just TV, right? Um, but we really didn't know who was going to win because some really strange things happened. Um, and, and looking back on it, it <laughs> I'll be honest, I think my design was the the forefront to win the season right and um it was a really cool design because it was a sliding weight that moved front to back on from putter face or sorry from driver face to driver back and so that um, design has a lot of versatility in club fitting when you're trying to adjust spin rate and i was semi-inspired by the cobra fly z flip weight so cobra made this weight that you had to take up, flip it and then put it back in and um and it was just a little clunky right so i wanted something a little bit sleeker a little bit smoother so i was like man we should turn this into a slide weight the problem with all this production is you have months and months and months even a year before you actually start filming and when i came out with that design it was very innovative but as we started to film the show nine months later um cobra and Taylor made both released a driver with a sliding weight front to back on the bottom. And basically they felt like there wasn't enough market differentiation in my product in comparison to those, because for one, the Cobra one was like identical. And then <laughs> the Taylor made had a little bit more versatility because we're talking the old um, T track that they had on their drivers where it was a sliding weight from side to front and from front to back um so you know it's those things that uh that happened that really cut my journey short um uh, but i felt like i still had a really good design and and it was cool to see cobra and taylormade actually prove that it was a product that worked in the real market and um and it kind of pushed their hand into deciding where they should go with who should win and I, I don't think that first season necessarily chose the product that was going to be the best performance. And and I think some people would be highly critical of what actually ended up in the first season. But um, they tried it again with season two. And the design that won was actually identical to my design from season <laughs> one. So uh, kind of even further solidified <laughs> my my design philosophy around what driver could potentially win that and um it, it was mine but i had to i don't know mix it up so <laughs> i was a victim of of a lot of bad timing but i i still know my design was good because other people came out with it so yeah absolutely i mean that kind of real-time validation is uh I'm, I'm sure it, it softened the blow well maybe it softened. maybe it made it worse but uh it, it's it's it has to feel good that at least uh, you were on the right track, that's for sure. Um, I'd love to just, I, I'll let you go after one more. Um, if you were to describe what is on the horizon, what's next for Weston Mon Golf, what would you say? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on putters. Um, there's really nothing else that I want to dive into. Um, I mean, I'm a golfer, so I love all aspects of equipment, but there's no way I'm going to get into the driver designing. like. It's like me trying to build a car from scratch out of my garage and then compete against Formula One race teams. Like there's just no chance. I can't do it. And so drivers are completely off the deck, right? Um, and that goes for fairways too. Irons, I mean, that could be something that I dabble in in the future, but again, it's you gotta make five to eight pieces of an iron and then you've got to make sure they're produced in a way that you can sell them and build them there's just a lot of components and when it really comes down to it like for a guy like me that likes to dabble in in golf equipment manufacturing it really just comes down to putters like it's the one that's accessible and i think the the current market has really shown that the boutique putter making is is here to stay because of the accessibility and availability of cnc milling 
and um, there's a lot of great designers out there so by no means is the the market ready to seize it's pretty saturated with some great great talent um but um you know for me it's just coming out with some new designs um i've, I've had some customers reach out and say they want uh, putters that have a more rounded look kind of like a traditional answer one style versus an answer two um, and so I'm going to be looking at designing a Dale type head and um, and then from there I might look into doing a mallet and um, but I always want to make sure one it's a hundred percent CNC'd out of a high quality carbon or high quality 303 stainless steel and that's really where I'm going. So hopefully I'm going to add some new designs um, before the end of this year and be able to um, showcase those and get those out. So, um, but that's really, really it for me. I guess that's not that exciting, but um, I, you know, I'm excited to see what my own take is on some of these designs and see how, um, how I can try and not disappoint those original designers from past. <laughs> Well, you haven't yet, and, and as your work has shown, uh, it doesn't look like you will anytime soon. Uh, Weston, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. It's been a pleasure to have you um, as, a, as a, an HMS craftsman. And uh, if, for those of you looking to purchase a Weston Mom Putter through Handmade Sticks, just click on the link below uh, alongside all other Handmade Sticks inventory. Weston, thank you so much for your time again. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, thank you. Thank you.